Good afternoon. Welcome to today's webinar. My name is John Norai and I'll be your moderator for today. <clears throat> Our topic is back to school, back to breakfast. Fuel your students for ex academic success with breakfast after the bell. Technical uh, information that you'll need during the webinar appears on your screen now. This is a toll free number to call if you have any problems uh, and any technical issues that you need help with. 1-888-799-9666, extension 2. And you'll need that ID number, 760-344-656. Take a minute to jot that down while I get to our next slide and get to uh, introduce your speaker to you for today. If you're tweeting, please use hashtag NASSP webinar. And if you are interested, follow NASSP on Facebook. Um, interesting uh, material shows up there all the time. The website, of course, is nassp.org, and at slash webinar, you'll find the recording of this webinar after the fact, that you can go back and hear it again, or look up information from it, or, or recommend it to a friend. Uh, very often we have people who say, oh, I, I heard that and I want so-and-so to hear it, and that's where we tell them to go to get that. You also can go to that webinar to get a certificate of attendance if you're in a district or a state that gives you that kind of credit, nassp.org slash webinar completer is where you'll get your uh, uh, help. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce Diane Girard. Diane joined FRAC in February of 2018 as a child nutrition policy analyst. She works with anti-hunger organizations as well as with local, state, and national governments to expand access to school breakfast programs for students across the country. Before joining FRAC, Diane was a policy analyst with the New York State Legislature working for the education communities and central staff in both the assembly and senate. Diane earned a bachelor of arts in political science and policy studies with a focus on education policy from Syracuse University. And Diane, I'd say, like to say welcome and thank you for doing this webinar for us today. Thanks, John. And as John just mentioned, my name is Diane Girard. I'm a child nutrition policy analyst with the Food Research and Action Center, or FRAC. Uh, we are a national nonprofit who works to improve public policies and increase access to federal nutrition programs to eradicate hunger and undernutrition in the United States. My work is specifically focused on ensuring low-income children have access to school meals by promoting best practices, such as implementing breakfast after the bell models and the community eligibility provision, all things we'll talk about on today's webinar. So I'm really excited and appreciate the opportunity to talk to you all about school breakfast and its many benefits today. Next slide. Diane, before I go to the slide, I just realized that I forgot to mention that if folks have questions that they, they want to ask during the webinar, we'd like them to put it in the Q&A um, section, and we will address those questions at the end of the webinar. Great. Thanks, John. You're welcome. It's all yours. So, Oh, thank you. So first, we're just going to go over some stats on the state of school breakfast across the country to better understand where we are as a nation and where school districts still have room to grow. So on an average school day, and you'll see some of these numbers up on the slide, in the 2016-17 school year, 92.5% of schools serving lunch also served breakfast. Almost 14.4 million children participated in the school breakfast program, and of that 14.4, nearly 12.2 million students were low-income children receiving a free or reduced high school breakfast. There has been a in previous years, likely because the economy is shrinking, which is also linked to breakfast out of the cafeteria and into the classroom. Diane, your sound is, is um, being corrupted. So oh, okay. would All you right. re repeat that for us, please? Just going back really quickly, there has been uh, continued growth in participation in the school. So it has been slower today. Um, out of the cafeteria and into the classroom and making it part of the school day. Also, a broad implementation of the community eligibility provision and improvements to how low-income children are, are identified as eligible for free school meals. Uh, these strategies have contributed to substantial growth over the past decade. There are now 4.1 million more low-income children receiving school breakfast in the 2016-17 school year compared to just a decade ago. So for decades, FRAC has set a benchmark in our annual uh, breakfast scorecard report. 
for each state to reach about 70, to reach 70 low income children with school breakfast for every 100 that are participating in school lunch. Because there is broad participation in the National School Lunch Program uh, nationwide uh, by low income students, it is a useful comparison by which to measure how many students could and should be benefiting from the school breakfast program each day. And as you can see here on the slide, in the 2016-17 school year, the ratio of low-income children participating in school breakfast to school lunch was still below FRAC's benchmark at 56.7 to every 100 students. If all states met FRAC's goal in the 2016-17 school year, close to 2.9 million more children would start the day with a healthy breakfast at school. And that is an incredible amount of more students that should be participating. So in our We're having a sound issue again, Diane. Um, would you repeat that, please? Sure. So, at all. Dollars lost in each school. States and school districts uh, would tap into an additional eight hundred three point seven million dollars in federal funding to support school food services and local economies if they met our goal. And you want to slide? So you can't talk about breakfast without mentioning the many benefits it yields. Research has shown that efforts to increase breakfast participation really do pay off. And you'll see them all listed right here on this slide. Um, School breakfast participation is linked to a wide range of positive academic and health outcomes. So for example, increasing school breakfast participation can alleviate childhood hunger, improve nutrition, and ensure children have a healthy start to their day. It leads to improved dietary intake, reduced food insecurity, decreases in tardiness and absences, improved student health, and fewer distractions in the classroom throughout the morning. Studies also show that students who eat school breakfast are more likely to have better concentration and memory, uh, be more alert, score higher on standardized tests, and have fewer disciplinary, disciplinary referrals. Briefs on the connections between breakfast and student learning, health, and behavior that I'll link to on our resource page at the end. Next slide. So one of the most important and proven ways to implement a strong, robust, school breakfast program is to consider methods such as breakfast in the classroom or grab and go or second chance breakfast. All three of these models fall under the umbrella term breakfast after the bell. Uh, so the key to success, a successful breakfast program, high participation. Making breakfast part of the school day dramatically increases participation, boosting both student achievement and health and school nutrition finances. So it really is a win-win for everybody. The traditional school breakfast program, which is served before school in the cafeteria, uh, still misses too many children and creates unnecessary obstacles for low-income families. Timing, convenience, stigma all contribute to low school breakfast participation. And this can be due to you know, rushed morning schedules, non-traditional working hours, um, buses arriving too late for children to eat breakfast in the cafeteria. But a really big one is the social stigma that the breakfast program is only for poor kids. Uh, it really keeps students who need these meals the most from participating, and this is very prevalent among middle and high school students. So we're just gonna, I'm gonna walk you through the different, um, the different models that are commonly used for breakfast after the bell. You have breakfast in the classroom, which meals are delivered to and eaten in the classroom at the start of the school day. School nutrition staff pack breakfast into coolers, maybe some insulated bags to be transported to each classroom by school nutrition staff, designated students or volunteers. Students eat during the first like 10 to 15 minutes or so of class, um, and they can do this during morning announcements or while the teacher takes attendance or reviews lesson plans for the day. Many teachers and principals cite breakfast in the classroom as an opportunity to incorporate social and emotional learning for younger students into the school day. So it's really important they're learning how to share a meal together, students are learning also how to clean up after themselves. It's really just a fantastic start. Under the grabbing model, children, particularly older students, can quickly grab the components of their breakfast from either a cart or a kiosk in the hallway or in the cafeteria line. And then they can either bring that to their classroom or another common area that's designated by the school to eat. Under second chance, 
students are offered a, a second chance to eat breakfast after homeroom or first period. So many students are not hungry first thing in the morning um, or sometimes like to sleep in and they may arrive just a few minutes really to spare before they're running to first period or homeroom. Serving these students breakfast after first period allows them ample time to arrive to class promptly while still providing them the opportunity to get a nutritious start to the day just a little bit later. Next slide. As part of our efforts to ensure students are getting a nutritious start to their day, we have created a number of resources uh, to engage and educate administrators about the program and to help them with implementation. <coughs> Excuse me. We have learned that administrators appreciate talking to and hearing about their peers' experience with the Breakfast After the Bell program since they all know the different hats that they're wearing and the different roles that you have as an administrator. In our school Breakfast After the Bell, Equipping Students for Success joint report that we did with NASSP, we surveyed 105 school principals in 67 districts representing 31 states whose schools offer Breakfast After the Bell. And the report found that 87% of surveyed principals recommend a breakfast after the bell program to their colleagues. And the great thing about this report too is half the principals that responded had already been running a breakfast after the bell program for three or more years. So we were really thrilled that we could capture these seasoned principals rich insights on how to launch the program but also how to sustain it over a period of time. And we did so in this toolkit that we also created with NASSP. Next slide. We also found that 61% of principals did not encounter any sort of logistical issues with implementing a breakfast after the bell program. For those who did report um, initial startup challenges, the most common concerns we heard were resistance from teachers, issues with post-breakfast cleanup, and interruptions in instructional time. However, these are all very workable solutions, um, and some of the best practices to eliminating these challenges is really just to engage and work closely with teachers and school staff throughout the planning process. We have seen principals pull the entire school staff into the initial planning meeting to field ideas, for example. Whether it's how to run the program or even to flag some initial concerns in order to investigate solutions, uh, bringing everyone together at the beginning, rather than halfway through, not only saves time, but it really generates collaboration and it's really important at the district level or at the school level. It's important to discuss the benefits of breakfast after the bell and your vision as an administrator for the program. You know, the different models that are out there. It's gonna vary school to school which one will work. Um, what you think will be the most successful in your school. Make sure to listen to staff's thoughts and concerns and if there are any questions, make sure you get back to them. Ensure all stakeholders, again, are included. This includes not just your child nutrition staff, but your custodians, your school support staff, your teachers, your assistant principals, and the superintendent. Flush out all the program details with everyone. For example, where and how breakfast will be served, the timing, roles and responsibilities, uh, you plan trainings, and communicate frequently and consistently with all stakeholders. And so going back to this trainings really quickly, it's really important to provide training for all staff in order to achieve a sustainable program. You know, if your school is not providing universal meals, explain to teachers, maybe in a training, uh, how the counting and claiming process will work. I'll quickly also just make a plug for trying to find time during existing meetings, if possible. One nutrition director we were recently working with tried to do all these trainings as part of already scheduled staff meetings um, or professional development. And that way, uh, she didn't want her to hear her staff say this program was creating any more work, but rather it was just a change in how they were operating at, you know, in the first 15 minutes of the school day um, in order to be more effective educators. Another best practice is to gather feedback. Many school districts continually survey students uh, to see what menu items are favorites and what they don't like, and have seen that reacting to feedback is a great way to get more students engaged and participating. This is also true for teachers and staff. And you just also have to you know, realize you may need to adjust staffing as needed. Janitorial and cafeteria staffing hours can be modified as necessary to kind of streamline program operations. Increasing or shifting hours enables staff to prepare for breakfast distribution and manage waste removal. And based on your challenges encountered, principals and planning teams reevaluate it and then they, al they alter their breakfast delivery in order to minimize any sort of interruptions to instructional time. 
And if you've received any pushback in your district uh, to breakfast after the Bell program, please feel free to reach out to us at FRAC. We're happy to strategize with you and share a few um, tactics that districts have used to overcome these obstacles. Next slide. Now, I know we've already discussed the many benefits of breakfast, but again, just want to highlight the findings from our principals survey with NASSP. Principals reported, on average, at least four positive outcomes associated with the implementation of an alternative breakfast service model. And I know these bars are a little bit small, so just quickly, I'll go over the top four. Um, so we had increased school breakfast participation, fewer occurrences of student hunger, improved student attentiveness, and overall improved if you can't actually read the tiny writing, principals also saw fewer visits to the school nurse, fewer occurrences of absenteeism, fewer disciplinary referrals, and improved scores on reading and math tests. So you are seeing all the many benefits as reported by these 105 principals. Next slide. So as I mentioned earlier, the secondary principals toolkit we developed with NASSP was based off of feedback from principals from the survey. The toolkit includes tips and resources for principals to help successfully implement breakfast after the bell. And that includes the sample outreach materials, uh, such as letters home to parents, staff memos, sample school announcements, event planning materials. We had a taste testing event and video contest for students to participate in. There's an example of that in the toolkit. Another great thing in the toolkit is the sample key stakeholder survey. So you can use it to garner feedback after the program has been initially implemented. And I was just at the uh, 2018 NASSP conference in July, and a principal uh, from a junior senior high school in rural Illinois came up to me and said that he and his food service director used every single resource um, in the toolkit to start doing grab and go this past uh, school year, the 1718 school year. This principal was able to use the um, FRAC Breakfast for Learning and Health Research Brief too to make a, first make a case to a superintendent. Once the superintendent was on board, they used the posters, the automated phone call scripts, and sample letters to let families know how about their new breakfast after the bell program, their grab and go. Next slide. It's also important to have students, parents, and teachers look favorably on the breakfast program. So really an effective marketing strategy can help promote your, um, your program to get more students participating. So here you'll see a list of effective marketing strategies that work best. You'll see the creating a digital marketing campaign. I think in today's social media age, that is really a route that many districts are going. Um, we've heard about some districts holding a logo or a poster contest um, among their art students. We also planning a national school breakfast week celebration, which typically falls in March. Uh, Palm Beach County in Florida did this great fall in love with school breakfast campaign. And campaign. They did it a few weeks earlier in February around Valentine's Day, but it was focused on just all the many reasons why students love school breakfast. Um, it's also, it's crucial that activities to promote school breakfast are age appropriate and varied. Marketing to an eight-year-old is going to be a lot different than marketing to a teenager. So you really need to analyze what your school students are interested in and use that to your advantage. Is there a TV character they're really into right now? Are they really interested in, in emojis? Um, if you're targeting a diverse group of students, you might also want to consider from a variety, um, you might want to consider foods from a variety of cultures for breakfast. You can do this by asking students to share their favorite breakfast items they eat at home. And obviously it's very important and helpful to promote your breakfast program in a variety of commonly spoken languages at your school to reach a larger audience of students and parents. So one way to get students interested in breakfast provided at school instead of outside locations is really to get input um, from your students uh, out, out front, because they are your customers, on what they want and they're willing to eat. So you can survey students on, their, on the different menu items that they like, what items are, might not be so popular. Um, like again, I said holding a taste test uh, is generally a good way to give students and their families a chance to sample food, especially at the beginning of the school year. For example, every year, Houston County in Georgia hosts this food show for students to taste and review potential menu items. So it's a great way to get students talking about your program um, and getting really excited about what's going to happen and, you know, for their breakfast. So another thing really quickly, just inviting special guests to breakfast. We also heard an example of a school district in Rhode Island that invited a professional football player to join their students for breakfast and that gets kids really excited too because it makes breakfast really cool. And one last thing on, on um, 
other th you know, best uh, practices to um, marketing your program. You can also create excitement by incorporating local foods and student grown foods from a school garden. And it's okay to start small. You can start by focusing on one local item to include in just one meal and really building it up from there. Um, using scratch cooking is another popular way to get students interested in their meals. And while your school garden may not produce enough food to make up a large portion of the breakfast menu, um, there are simple ways to integrate uh, smaller items, for example, maybe including some herbs and some scrambled eggs or berries with yogurt or tomatoes and cilantro for fresh salsa alongside a breakfast burrito. So if students are grabbing breakfast on their way into school from fast food restaurants, say you have a Dunkin' Donuts that's right outside of the school, you should also take a look at if they're doing any sort of marketing that you can mimic at the school. You can also ask yourself how your breakfast prices compared to local fast food prices um, compare. So providing breakfast at no charge, for example, one of, is a great proven way to increase participation. Next slide. And these are just a couple of resources for you in these next two slides. Um, as part of the Principles Toolkit, FRAC, in partnership with NASSP, created some of these very colorful posters. You can use your cafeteria, your hallway, um, in the classrooms, and links to these posters will be provided for your use at the end of the webinar. Next slide. Other things we have there, the partners are part of just released uh, this new step-by-step -step guide on how to start a breakfast after the Bell program. I encourage you to check it out. That you need will help you be successful every step of the way um, in setting up your breakfast program. Next slide. school meals is to adopt the community eligibility provision. This allows high poverty schools to provide free breakfast and lunch to all students without the need to collect or verify school meal applications or keep track of meals by fee category. Instead, schools only need to count the number of meals served each day. Uh, offering meals for free under provisions like community eligibility eliminates two common barriers to breakfast participation or low breakfast participation, which is the stigma associated with the program and the cost. And this helps to increase breakfast participation and even more. The effectiveness of breakfast after the bell is certainly amplified when breakfast is offered free to all students regardless of income. And under community eligibility, school districts can choose to participate either district-wide or group schools together. Um, as long as they have an overall identified student percentage of 40% or more. And just really quickly, um, that identified student includes children who are directly certified for free meals through data matching because their households are receiving uh, commonly SNAP or TANF or FDIPR benefits. Some states also Medicaid benefits. And children who are certified for free meals without an application because they're homeless or migrant or enrolled in Head Start or foster care are also eligible to be included in a school district's identified student uh, percentage. And just some quick stats on community eligibility. This program is continuing to grow each year. Uh, it became uh, first available nationwide in the 2014-15 school year. And um, as of the 2016-17 school year, there were over 20,000 schools participating and over 3,538 school districts, meaning that more than 9.7 million children attend community eligibility schools. So there are many that are not participating, um, especially that are high poverty schools. So if you need any more information on community eligibility, you can go to FRAC's uh, community eligibility webpage. It's also linked on our resource slide at the end of the webinar. If you have any questions or concerns about implementation, please reach out to us. We are here to help you and answer your questions on community eligibility. And then next slide. And again, so all the resources that I talked about uh, throughout the webinar are listed here. So we have our the Breakfast for Learning and for Health and for Behavior, um, our research briefs, which uh, provide information on how breakfast and student achievement and learning are all connected. Um, we also have that How to Start a Breakfast After the Bell program guide that goes into all the details and next steps that you should be taking. Um, we also have the uh, Principles Breakfast After the Bell Toolkit that we worked on with NASSP and all of our posters that I showed on an earlier slide. And then again, a link to the com our community eligibility website. And the next slide. And with that, this is my uh, contact information. Please feel free to reach out if you have any questions about 
breakfast after the bell models, uh, breakfast generally, or any best strategies, any workarounds, any challenges you're having, or on community eligibility as well. Thank you, Diane. Uh, a couple of questions that have come up. One is, uh, do you have, I, I think you, you said this, but uh, we'd like you to repeat it. What percentage of schools are currently participating um, in this program? Yeah, so going back, we have some data from the 2016-2017 school year. Um, so 92.5% of schools serving also serving breakfast. So you have a, a very, very close amount to um, who are also doing breakfast. And I think I said this before, too, we have 14.4 million children participating in breakfast, um, which is a number that continues to grow every year. Thank you. And, and another question is, um, what are some of the um, stumbling blocks or reservations principals have voiced about implementing the program? Yeah, so I think we saw this in our survey, um, you know, just sort of those encountering those initial startup challenges. Um, and most commonly, we saw uh, resistance from maybe some school staff. I think sometimes you see that when it's a brand new program, people are just unsure what it might bring or if there's going to be pests in the classroom. And, and a really a great way to address those issues is to have meetings with your staff at the very beginning so that no one is surprised by the program when it's implemented and letting people know what their roles and responsibilities are. And... Um, you know, addressing any of the, the questions they have with answers. I actually was just on the phone this earlier this afternoon with a principal from Virginia, and she said there was some resistance from teachers initially that about, um, you know, pests and, and things, you know, trash everywhere and, and thing, milk spilling on the floor and having rodents. And one of the ways they, they had one-on-one -on -one meetings with teachers but, and they also provided some training programs for them. But they also, uh, a week before they implemented the program, they gave teachers trash bags and cleaning supplies and wipes and brooms and, and just a bunch of you know, supplies so that they felt like they had a sense of security that they had all these things already before the program even started. Um, so another issue, you know, issues of post-breakfast cleanup, which again, like I said, sometimes just talking to teachers and custodial staff to make sure that supplies necessary supplies are provided is really important. And also there are always some concerns that this might interrupt um, instructional time, you know, take away from the academic school day. I think, you know, the, the research is clear that breakfast really does help um, students with their academic success. It keeps kids from being hungry. It can really start the day ready to learn. Um, and really it, it, it's just a 10 to 15 minutes of the start of the school day. And it's very easy to tie in anything else you're doing that day. So tie in your lesson plans or make your morning announcements and take your attendance. I just think the benefits are so, you know, exponential that um, it really makes the program worth it is what we hear from principals and teachers. Well, thank you again, Diane. Uh, this has been informative and um, I'm sure that our, um, our participants uh, are grateful for the resources. Um, Again, you can get copies of the um, NASSP on the NASSP, NASSP website and get copies of the slides, which have all the links to get you those resources so that you can use them in your school. And I'd like to extend an invitation to uh, everyone on the webinar to join your colleagues for the 2019 National Principals Conference sponsored by NASSP. It'll be July 18th through 20th in Boston, Massachusetts. And you can learn more about the conference and register at the address that is shown on the slide. And uh, without further ado, I say thank you and appreciate everybody's participation today.